A very good afternoon to you all. On behalf of the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, I welcome you to this webinar session 13 on radiology in COVID-19. Before starting with the scientific schedule, I am connecting you to Professor J.S. Thakur, who is the chairman of PGI Committee on COVID-19 Prevention and IEC for his opening remarks. So thank you Arpit and uh, welcome to the webinar 13, which is on a very important uh, topic on radiology in COVID-19. We are all aware that uh, investigation is a very routine part of uh, today's medical setup. And uh, radiology is one of the common investigation techniques which are applied in most of uh, our situation. So uh, this is a very important area which is uh, cross-cutting and relevant to all of us. We have a very eminent uh, panel of uh, expert uh, from the Department of Radio Diagnosis and Imaging PGI. We have uh, Dr. Anandita Sinha, Professor Mandeep Kang and uh, Professor Ajay Kumar. And I'm sure the deliberation will be very useful and you will have a lot of uh, questions. So once again, I welcome you all on behalf of PGI to this webinar. Thank you very much. Well, uh, many thanks to Professor Thakur. And uh, now I'm connecting you all the way to Dr. Aninda Sinha from the Department of Radio Diagnosis at PGI Chandigarh. And she will be talking about imaging in COVID-19 when and how. Connecting you to Dr. Sena. Good afternoon. So I will be discussing imaging in COVID-19. When do you image and how do you image? So we will uh, keep it very simple and then decide on uh, what the imaging algorithm should be. And before we start imaging, we will be discussing a basic few details about what the patients uh, uh, present with, what are the imaging algorithms, what are the uh, screening algorithms before we go on to the imaging part. So uh, when, do we, uh, when do we image? The patients present as either a suspect case or a probable case or a positive case. And sometimes they also present as an incidentally detected case. And most of the time they would already have been imaged in some form by that time. And the overview also will uh, present a basic uh, minimum about how to image with uh, focus on portable x-rays and also with uh, point of care ultrasound or uh, POCUS and also with uh, CT scan and uh, also our guideline about why not to do an MRI because it's almost impossible to clean the uh, machine with this uh, modality. So uh, first of all, who, how are we defining these cases? So the World Health Organization uh, defines a suspect case and uh, the ICMR guidelines also as a fever more than or equal to 38 degrees with at least one sign of respiratory disease like cough or shortness of breath. However, it is important to note that elderly and children may have a wide variety of symptoms which may not point to the diagnosis of a pneumonia per se and they have neurological and gastrointestinal symptoms, some present with the cardiovascular symptoms. So this is a, you have to cast your net wide to uh, diagnose someone as a suspect case. So there is a probable case and who is a probable case? A probable case is a case whose uh, test by RT-PCR is actually inconclusive or the test is not available in a very resource constrained, constrained scenario. And however, you still have a high clinical suspicion that the patient still has COVID-19. And of course, you have a laboratory confirmed case. So if you see that uh, where imaging is actually required, suspect case imaging may be deferred in most of the scenarios unless the suspect is hemodynamically unstable or has come with some other pathology where imaging is absolutely urgent and needs to be done because of a life-threatening situation. In a probable case where you don't have the test or the test is inconclusive and the clinician still has a high clinical suspicion that the patient has uh, uh, COVID-19, imaging plays a more important role and such patients should be imaged with all precautions if the test is negative. In confirmed cases again, imaging is not required in most of the mild cases. Imaging is required in moderate to severe cases and if the patient is critical. So who should be tested and by tested we mean the RT-PCR. Just a brief overview, all symptomatic patients with uh, influenza-like illness that is fever, 
cuff or respiratory distress and uh, of all uh, varieties with travel with laboratory confirmed cases of our uh, healthline healthcare workers or frontline workers and people from containment areas all patients with sari or that is severe acute respiratory infection which is defined as an influenza like illness which requires hospitalization asymptomatic direct as well as high risk con contacts and high risk contacts are those with comorbidities and now uh, recently on 18th of may this last guideline has come out where you have to test on day 5 and day 10 of coming into contact and all, of course all symptomatic influenza like illness patients within hotspots and containment zones all hospitalized patients who subsequently develop influenza like illness symptoms and all symptomatic influenza like illness among the returnees from foreign countries or uh, migrants from different states within 7 days of illness now the most important point to note from our perspective or images perspective is that or a clinician's perspective is that no emergency procedure including deliveries or say treatment of uh, cardiovascular disease who presents with a myocardial infarction or a cerebrovascular disease which will be covered la uh, later on in the third talk should be delayed for lack of test sample can be sent for testing if indicated as above simultaneously but we have to proceed as normally of course with full precautions and image and treat the patient so the first scenario should be image an asymptomatic high risk contact or healthcare worker for screening it's very very lucrative because chest x rays are easily available x rays and ct scan scans are more readily available and within reach rather than the rt pcrs but it is not recommended and why so because even if i have a symptom of covid like Ill covid 19 or uh, influenza like illness or even sari and have a normal x ray or even a normal CT, it does not rule out COVID-19. So we will be uh, having a false sense of security if you have a normal X-ray and this does not get us anywhere. So it's not recommended that we image a patient for screening, especially if you are asymptomatic. So should we do a CT then? Again, the recommendation from all over, uh, including Indian guidelines, including the American guidelines, including all the societies, thoracic societies that have got together and made guidelines recently is that CT or even X-ray, even CT is not a substitute for RT-PCR and consider testing with RT-PCR according to the local recommendations of that state or country and uh, of course wait for the availability of RT-PCR which is actually right now the definitive on test only. So why not CT? Of course, this will be covered later in the second talk, but CT does not have any specific feature to differentiate from other conditions like swine flu, like H1N1 or organizing pneumonia or even fungal infections. So who should be imaged or screened with imaging? If you have a suspect with mild symptoms, it's, bet it's the first uh, pathway is that the patient is isolated. And no, there is of course no role of imaging in screening and RT-PCR is the pathway to go through. But we need to image if the patient is immunocompromised, the patient has diabetes or cancer or is on immunosuppressant drug, drugs, patient has other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, again any chronic liver, kidney disease or uh, the symptoms are getting worse and they are not explained by the COVID-19 infection and of course to rule out other causes or complications of the disease. Now what are the comorbidities that present to a practitioner? Diabetes mellitus, hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, which is a common presentation, coronary artery disease, and patients with COPD and cancer and immunocompromised or immunosuppressants are the comorbidities where we should image more uh, frequently or be ready to image rather than just a patient who is asymptomatic or at a mild case of COVID-19. Now, if a suspect has only moderate to severe symptoms, again, we isolate, we test, and we image. Now the question is when do we image? The best scenario is to wait for the test result to come and image if we can and the patient is stable and is not requiring any sort of uh, hemodynamic support or no intervention is immediately required because of the problem of uh, not being able to isolate and give a machine dedicated for these patients in most scenarios. If you have the luxury of different machines or portable x-ray machines which you can dedicate for suspect patients you can as well image immediately when the patient is a suspect and help in the triaging. But in many scenarios, including ours, where it's not possible to give a machine separately for triaging in a suspect case, we should not mix up patients because 
in a large volume patient care center it is not actually practically possible to separately clean the machine after each and every patient and there is a chance of transmission in between patients if the machine is not properly cleaned. You have to remember that the chest x-ray detector or any detector is touching the body parts of the patient, touching the chin of the patient and these are highly uh, contagious substances where fomite transmission is liable to occur if you are not very careful. Now when to image a confirmed case, again we isolate, we image at baseline if required that is if the symptoms are moderate or severe or if the patient has any comorbidities as we said earlier or you suspect a complication like ARDS or a pleural effusion which can help in decreasing the symptoms or a pneumothorax which can be treated immediately or if a patient has severe symptoms and is on a ventilator and you suspect a ventilator acquired pneumonia. These are the settings when we have to image and it's not necessary to image every day routinely in even a patient who is admitted. It has to be clinical based, need based and depending upon whether the imaging will change actually the management of the patient. And why do we say that don't image, be careful while imaging, be careful while requisitioning for imaging is that COVID-19 and repeatedly this is an important uh, finding does not have specific features even on CT and this has been highlighted in the recent articles that have come out, previous articles which were initially based on the initial outbreak in China were very enthusiastic about CT findings being positive but there was something known as a selection bias and confirmation bias and if I tell you that the first two patients had COVID-19, if you look at the last image of this patient, you will always also say that this patient had COVID-19 but however this patient was COVID-19 negative and had organizing pneumonia. Similar picture can occur and does occur very frequently in H1N1 or swine flu and this is why chest CT cannot be used as a diagnostic or screening mechanism to rule out COVID-19 even if the chest CT is positive unless you have a very high pretest probability that the patient is going to be COVID-19 and this is not the scenario uh, at least in India right now. Now again another patient from uh, another uh, the article where you see these roundish con consolidated nodules with peripheral ground glass halo. Any radiologist will tell you in any other setting, if you had shown me this imaging six months ago, I would have closed my eyes and blindly said that this is a case of fungal pneumonia. But this is a patient who has actually nodular consolidations and nodular GGOs due to COVID-19. So it's very difficult not only to diagnose COVID-19 based on imaging, but even if a patient has COVID-19 in this scenario, to differentiate between the patient having COVID-19 on or any other comorbid chest illness like a fungal infection, is very difficult. Even tuberculosis may be difficult, aspiration may have the similar nodular features, tree bud nodules and it, this will be discussed later in detail in the next talk. So what are the recommendations? Fleischner Society, a highly respectable chest society has indicated that imaging is not routinely indicated as a screening test as I have been highlighting before. And also not only as a screening test but is not to be done for patients with mild features unless they have a risk of disease progression due to comorbidities. However, in moderate to severe uh, cases, patients may be imaged and it is indicated in cases of respiratory uh, worse, uh, the status worsening. And of course, if it is a resource constrained environment where access to CT or uh, X-ray is limited, patients uh, may be preferred, X-ray may be preferred Unless, unless there are features of uh, respiratory uh, worsening which warrant the use of CT but these are very very uh, uncommon scenarios and the uh, society also recommends that daily x-ray is not be done CT only if the patient has uh, worsening features or even after recovery if the patient has worsened from COVID-19 then CT should be done and if the patient has incidental findings uh, suggestive of COVID-19 then a CT scan may be done of the chest and these findings have to be communicated immediately as uh, likely due to COVID-19 or possibly due to COVID-19 or uh, are typical of COVID-19 as the case may be to the clinician. The Indian uh, guidelines, the IRIA, ICRI chest subspeciality group has also similar guidelines and do not advocate the use of CT scan for diagnosis or screening and only for severe respiratory complications. Now if the patient has COVID symptoms and has some other illness or some other condition which requires imaging. For instance, in uh, pregnancy, you have to image for the uh, do the ultrasound at a specific time period to rule out your uh, uh, anomalies. In children also who have COVID symptoms, 
or in patients with comorbidities, we have to be ready to image, but we must also be taking precautions, not only for ourselves, but also ensure that the patient has to be masked, the patient's attendant has to be masked, and we have to take the standard and droplet precautions. N95 is a must for any patient with uh, an investigation, uh, investigating or positioning any patient with uh, COVID-like symptoms and uh, also a visor is a very, very low cost alternative. Remember those who are wearing glasses, glasses are not an alternative to visor. So if you have uh, prescription glasses, these cannot be taken as an alternative to visor and a visor has to be worn. A fluid resistant coverall or a gown is a must again along with gloves shoe cover and cap and it is not only important to wear them but to know how to wear them and most important to know how to doff them or uh, take them off in a very particular sequence and re repeated training and practice is required among all of us to be ready to do it properly because doffing is the most dangerous time and uh, where even a slight mistake can cause infection in the healthcare worker. So how to image? X-rays are required. We should do it with portable radiographs and of course, if possible, the best possible way to do it is have a dedicated machine for the positive patients and also if you need a ultrasound, do a bedside ultra ultrasound with a point of care ultrasound which is known as POCUS for looking at the lungs as well where you can see the progression of ARDS. Imaging of positive and suspect patients again should not be intermingled because it is impossible to clean the machine properly and we should not transport the patient for imaging. Uh, to the main department or to another center which causes an increased chance of infection or transmission between the patient, people who are shifting the patient and imaging should be based on need to rule out any complication. So post procedure it is important to take the machine to a parking area, wear non-sterile gloves and wipe down all the surfaces including the screen and as well as the handle with an alcohol rub and remove the gloves inside out and discard. So uh, if you have a disinfection trolley, well and good, you can make do with other trolleys where we have this uh, kind of uh, three uh, step disinfection where we have uh, some warm water, 1% hypochlorite solution as well as detergent to uh, clean it with a one wipe method and this requires again training. So also train your hospital attendants or your sanitary attendants as well as the technician to properly clean the machine because an unclean machine will be a risk to the people who are handling these machines. Now, again for CT, sterilize the machine after every single patient. Ideally, it is uh, best to provide a dedicated CT for use in COVID-19 positive patients only. In our institute, we have been lucky. We have dedicated uh, the CT who was an isolated uh, uh, area in the OPD, which has only that OPD CT area where we are just doing the COVID-19 positive patients. And it is also important to maintain and train the disinfection procedure after each patient and machine cleaning with recommended disinfectant with hypochlorite 1% uh, solution or benzalkonium based solutions and keyboard and a mouse with alcohol wipes is required. Also ensure adequate ventilation and do not take a, uh, the next patient up at least till the ventilation uh, has taken care of, has been taken care of, care of and the routine recommendation is at least a one hour gap between each patient. So MRI completely to be avoided absolutely unless uh, it is life threatening again because machine cannot be disinfected completely and it is a closed system. Right, so to summarize, imaging is not recommended for screening or as a diagnostic tool for COVID-19 pneumonia. CT should be reserved for a clinical suspicion of complication or a different diagnosis if, you have, if the clinician has a, it in mind. But again, it may be difficult to rule out a concomitant chest infection, especially in mild to uh, in moderate to severe lung infections where this lung is completely covered with uh, consolidation. As radiologists, as technicians, we should be ready to image with full precaution when needed. Have the full armamentarium ready, be trained in donning and doffing techniques with repeated practice and stay safe, image cautiously. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sina, for such a practical insight into when and how to image during COVID-19. Uh, before I call upon the next speaker for the day, it is your chance to post us your questions. Uh, you can very well use the YouTube live chat and send us all your questions and your queries and we will be taking them at the panel discussion during the end of the session. Uh, now I am connecting you to Professor Mandeep Khan uh, from the Department of Radio Diagnosis at PGI and she will be talking about radiological findings in COVID-19. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Arpit. Uh, I will be talking on the radiological findings in COVID-19 pneumonias. So what are the other tools which we have at our disposal? We have chest radiographs, we have bedside portable or point of care ultrasound, and we have computed tomography. For chest radio, uh, uh, for COVID-19 patients uh, who are confirmed or are suspect, our emphasis should be on performing imaging them with portable radiographs. As Dr. Anandita has pointed out, using portable radiographs, uh, uh, radiographic machines avoids mixing of the non-infected with the positive patients in the hospital corridors when the patients are being shifted from where they are being uh, treated to the radiology areas. It avoids mixing in the radiology waiting areas as well as inside the radiography rooms and also avoids cross-contamination through the medium of the X-ray machines or the X-ray operators. Uh, in, while doing portable radiographs, we prefer doing uh, using a digital radiography machine over a computed radiography, radiography uh -huh. machine because it is faster and more efficient and more importantly, the image is Im available immediately for viewing to, by the clinician. And there is no uh, transport of the cassettes to and from the radiology department, which is uh, part of the feature of uh, CR machines. And since the transport of the machines to and from the department also have to be uh, done by the uh, healthcare worker in full uh, personal protective equipment, so it doubles the amount of manpower required and therefore the PPE. And using DR halves the requirement of manpower and therefore halves the requirement of PPE. In our institute, we are doing a baseline chest x-ray in almost all the admitted patients uh, uh, at baseline. However, we are omitting uh, baseline x-rays in children who are asymptomatic. The frequency of the subsequent radiographs is being determined solely on clinical grounds. Uh, as uh, already said that the recommendation by the Indian College of Radiology and Imaging Chest Radiology Subspeciality Group is to do an x-ray at baseline in patients who have moderate to severe symptoms. And it can be done in mild cases only if there are associated risk factors for developing severe disease present in the patient. Let us look at uh, what uh, literature has to show uh, till now. This is a study from very few uh, uh, studies are there on the findings on chest radiographs. Most of the studies in literature are concentrating on CT. This is a study from uh, Italy in which they had 58 patients of whom 32 underwent a chest radiograph and of these 5 patients had completely normal radiographs. And uh, the findings consisted of uh, consolidation, hazy increased opacity and these findings are bilateral in the majority of patients. And they found uh, more than half the patients had lower zone involvement and upper lobe uh, involvement alone was very uncommon. This is a study from China in which they compared the time course and severity of the chest x-ray appearance and correlated it with the RT-PCR. They had 64 patients with a mean age of 56 years in whom the initial RT-PCR was positive in 91% of patients while the chest x-ray was positive only in 69% of patients. On the contrary, 6 patients had uh, abnormality on chest x-ray before RT-PCR became positive subsequently. And again, the consolidation was the most common finding followed by ground glass opacities and these were, had a peripheral and lower zone distribution and were bilateral in almost half the patients. Pleural effusion was distinctly uncommon and they found that the severity of chest x-ray findings peaked at 10 to 12 days from the date of onset of the symptoms. Uh, in a retrospective review of 99 patients uh, in a single hospital in Wuhan, uh, China in January 20, uh, they found on uh, chest radiographs or on CT, a bilateral pneumonia was present in 75% of patients. And there was, a, a, however, the findings were highly non-specific and there was overlap with uh, H1 influenza, CME pneumonia as well as atypical pneumonia. So we can summarize that uh, the, on chest x-ray, the findings are the, uh, uh, or abnormalities are usually bilateral and show a peripheral subpleural predominance. Uh, predilection for the posterior parts of the lungs with the lower and the lower lobes and the findings are usually hazy opacities which progress to cons uh, consolidation and they show a multifocal multilobar involvement. So uh, the reporting format has been suggested by the ICI, uh, ICRI chest radiology subgroup in which we list all the findings as present or absent and we also list the zones in which they are seen and then we uh, give a severity score by doing a visual assessment of the overall area of lung involvement. 
if only up to 25% of the lung is involved, it's a score of 1 and uh, more than 75% is a score of 4. So if it is a total score of 1, it is classified as mild findings, uh, moderate if the score is 2 to 3 and severe if 4. And the purpose is to convey the severity of the lung involvement to the clinician and more importantly for comparison with follow-up radiographs. So uh, normal chest x-ray, there are no findings, however COVID-19 cannot be excluded. Classic or probable COVID-19, they will have findings which have a, show, a lower low predominance, uh, peripheral predominance, there are multiple bilateral areas of GTOs or consolidation. Indeterminate for COVID-19 if it does not fit the classic patterns or uh, non-COVID-19 if you have findings which are not seen with COVID-19 such as low bar pneumonia, pleural effusion, etc. So uh, looking at the radiographs uh, which have been done in our institute, uh, a lot of our patients were uh, asymptomatic who were found during contact tracing and in most of these asymptomatic individuals, we have found normal chest, rays, uh, chest x-rays. These are radiographs from four different patients and as we can see, they are completely normal. Mildly asymptomatic patients, what we are seeing is this more of a reticular pattern. There is increased reticulation seen bilaterally. These again are uh, x-rays from four different patients and these are generally uh, diffusely distributed in both the lungs. Uh, uh, classical findings of COVID-19 are seen in these uh, x-rays. Again, four different patients. You have bilateral involvement. You have in diffuse hazy areas of increased opacity and certain, certain areas you are seeing, like in this child, you are seeing areas of consolidation. The findings are generally bilateral uh, and are showing a lower low predominance as in the, this case as well as in this case. So this is a patient who on the 10th of uh, April at admission, he had these bilateral uh, uh, areas of increased uh, uh, opacity with areas of consolidation, uh, diffusely seen in the right lung and in the left lower lobe. And one week later, the radiograph shows complete clearing of the opacities. Another patient uh, had these areas of consolidation and increased opacity at baseline which showed some increase in the subsequent radiograph three days later, but uh, one week later the radiographs show, uh, the last radiograph shows complete clearing of the opacities and is now normal. This is a child showing the classic pattern of a white out lung. You have diffused hazy increased opacity in the entire uh, uh, lung, uh, both lungs with air bronchograms. So this is a patient who had a slightly more protracted course uh, of uh, disease with us here. At the baseline, we see areas of increased opacity with the areas of consolidation in both the lungs. And this has shown progression of the findings uh, three days later. Uh, another three days later, now this has progressed to form almost mass-like areas of consolidation in both lungs. But a week later, we can see that well, most of these areas of consolidation has started showing clearing. And what we find is later that you have these uh, development of these residual parenchymal bands in the form of these linear opacities. And this is the last x-ray when the patient was asymptomatic and was going to be discharged. We can see that some amount of residual fibrosis is there, but the consolidated changes have completely resolved. Moving on to CT chest. Uh, a series reported the CT findings in 99 patients uh, in China uh, in the month of uh, uh, Jan, Feb 2020. And they again uh, showed the same bilateral multifocal le lesions with a peripheral distribution in the majority, uh, with the most common finding being the presence of GGOs, uh, followed by consolidation, crazy paving, interporal lobular septal thickening, and adjacent pleural uh, thickening. Pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and lymphadenopathy were distinctly uncommon findings. And uh, an important finding was that no abnormality was seen on the baseline CT in 21 patients of these 99. And even on subsequent CTs, only three patients showed positive findings later. Four stages have been described of the, uh, in the disease. Uh, in the early phase, that is from the zero to four days, uh, you find small ground glass opacities, which are generally distributed subpleurally in the lower part of the lungs. The stage of progressive disease is from 5 to 8 days where the infection quickly extends to a bilateral multilobar distribution with diffuse DGOs, consolidation and the presence of crazy paving. 
the peak phase is from 10 to 13 days where there is further expansion of the findings to the peak and absorption starts about two weeks after the onset of symptoms during which the consolidation is slowly absorbed. The crazy paving disappears and you have, may have the residual parenchymal bands and this is the same pattern as I've showed you in the series of x-rays from that one patient. So uh, uh, again CT test will show uh, GTOs with a sensitivity of 69%, consolidation which is usually multifocal more commonly involving bilateral lower lobes, peripheral airspace opacities which may be patchy or confluent, diffuse airspace disease which is similar to other infections or even ARDS and uh, these findings usually involve into a diffuse coalescent or consolidated pattern within 1 to 3 weeks with a peak at 6 to 12 days. This is the same study from Como, Italy, 58 patients of whom 42 underwent CT. CT was normal in two patients and the brown glass opacities was the most common finding in 95% of their patients and these uh, almost the majority also had consolidation. And all their cases had bilateral involvement with a predominantly peripheral pattern, the majority uh, crazy paving, fibrous stripes, subpleural lines, architectural distortion and perilesional vascular thickening. A meta-analysis uh, was performed of studies of chest CT in COVID-19 patients to evaluate the diagnostic performance of CT as a screening or a diagnostic tool for uh, COVID-19. And they found a pool sensitivity of 94% for CT and 89% for RT-PCR. However, the specificity was only 37 for CT with a positive predictive value of only 1.5 to 30.7%. So here I have summarized the findings uh, in CT chest in a decree, the order of uh, frequency they, uh, of their presence. So ground glass opacities with or without consolidation is the most common finding. Uh, multiple lesions involving different areas of the lungs, both the lungs being involved, uh, predilection for posterior and lower lung involvement and uh, presence of consolidation are very common findings. A uh, little less common findings are a crazy pa paving pattern which may not be seen in all patients, reticular pattern due to interlobular septal thickening, pleural thickening, bronchial wall thickening or bronchiectasis. Uh, very uncommon findings are presence of nodules, subpleural lines and fibrosis, while rare findings are presence of mediastinal lymphadenopathy, pericardial effusion or halo sign and cavitation and calcification are two findings which are just completely not seen in the presence of only COVID-19 pneumonia. So the Radiological Society of North America expert consensus, state, consensus statement on reporting chest CT findings related to COVID-19. They propose a reported language for the CT findings related to COVID-19. And they say that you can use the term typical appearance when you find commonly reported imaging features of great specificity for COVID-19 pneumonias. And they have given these examples that you have typical, these are the typical uh, imaging features when you have these uh, uh, ground glass opacities which are diffusely distributed in both the lungs and they have a kind of a rounded configuration and they can be presence of crazy paving due to intersubnobular septal thickening. The findings are indeterminate in appearance if you have absence of the typical features or you can have uh, multifocal diffuse uh, GGOs without a specific pattern and they have given this example. This is uh, patchy GGOs with no specific pattern in a case of COVID-19 and this is presence of GGOs with no specific appearance in a case of uh, acute lung injury from drug toxicity. You use the term atypical appearance when there is absence of typical or indeterminate features and presence of uh, findings which are not seen in COVID and you use negative for pneumonia when you have no CT features to suggest pneumonia. So this is a uh, kind of atypical uh, fi CT findings. You have the presence of uh, uh, two different, these are two different patients. You have pre bud opacities and cavitation. This is active tuberculosis and this is a respiratory syncytial virus infection. Uh, we have been limiting uh, CT in our patients as a problem solving tool when the clinicians uh, uh, need it. So this was a middle aged lady who uh, presented with this typical appearance of bilateral multifocal hazy increased opacities and uh, they, uh, she was immunocompromised with a history of uh, being on steroids and uh, she was not settling so the clinicians felt that we might be dealing with two infections. And uh, the CT shows these areas of ground glass opacities with the crazy paving here 
and these are multifocal, mostly peripheral, progressing to consolidation in bilateral uh, lower lobes. There is no, uh, there is no rounding of the uh, ground glass opacities and we really could not uh, uh, say that this is COVID-19 uh, or even uh, pneumocystis carinae and pneumonia may be coexisting. This is another uh, patient who had these uh, uh, appearance of these multiple nodular opacities in bilateral lungs, multifocal involving all zones with this area of consolidation in the right lower lobe. And this, uh, uh, the findings progressed on the subsequent x-ray with the consolidation becoming even more evident and uh, CT was asked for to rule out uh, concomitant uh, tuberculosis. And this is what the CT showed. We had these areas of uh, we had these areas of uh, uh, ground glassing, as we can see here, GGOs. But the predominant finding was uh, this presence of centrilobular nodules with a tree in bud appearance and larger nodules with areas of cavitation. And this was a case of active tuberculosis along with COVID-19. This was a lady who was an uh, old case of a cerebrovascular accident and she was actually bedridden and had developed contractures and she was found to be COVID uh, positive. And besides the bilateral uh, increased reticulation and some hazy opacities, we could see this patchy area of dense consolidation in the lower zone. And again, she was not really showing significant improvement and therefore a CT was asked for. And we can see these bilateral hazy areas of these ground glass opacities, uh, diffusely distributed, multifocal in nature, mainly in a peripheral distribution. But in the lower lobes, what the uh, right lower lobe, corresponding to the area of consolidation, we saw this area of fibrosis and uh, consolidation when we uh, gave this as a report of an old uh, chronic aspiration pneumonia. There are two other, uh, the clinical scenario is if the patient is not suspected for COVID-19, should we be performing a CT chest in all the patients who are otherwise going, undergoing CT for a clinical condition other than COVID-19? Will it help us? And how do we report the CT if a patient who has undergone a CT chest for an indication other than COVID-19 pneumonia and we find that he has CT findings which are either typical or indeterminate for COVID-19? And we will uh, address both these issues in the question and answer session later. And I will uh, conclude by saying that chest imaging should not be used as a screening tool for COVID-19. And if we do have a uh, suspect or positive patients, the mainstay of imaging should be by using portable chest X-rays, with CT being reverse, uh, reserved for cases showing either worsening of the clinical uh, situation or as a uh, problem-solving tool. And the CT findings in COVID-19 pneumonia are non-specific and overlap with other conditions such as viral pneumonias, organizing pneumonias due to acute blood toxicity and pneumocystis infections. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, many thanks to Professor Mandeep for such a deep insight into the radiological findings uh, in COVID-19 patients. And this is your chance again to post us your questions through the YouTube live chat and we will be taking all your questions in the panel discussion at the end. Now I'm connecting you to Professor Ajay Kumar from the Department of Radio Diagnosis at PGI. And Professor Ajay will be talking about intervention radiology in COVID-19. A very good afternoon to all. And uh, I hope and wish that uh, you all are uh, keeping safe and healthy. So I'm uh, I'll be discussing about uh, the intervention radiology in the era of uh, this pandemic. So COVID-19 has created certain global healthcare crisis. And uh, second thing, there is no established guideline. And unlike radiology, diagnostic radiology, the intervention subspecialty deals, deals directly with the patient. So the casual attitude cannot be like practiced in this uh, particular subspecialty. Presently, IR plays a pivotal role in image-guided image diagnostic and therapeutic treatment procedures. And these therapeutic procedures can be on the elective basis and on the emergency basis. Elective patients can wait for the downfall of the pandemic. But the emergency patients, they cannot wait and we have to uh, have our guidelines ready right now for the treatment or help of these patients. So emergency life saving procedures uh, uh, with the intervention radiology, they can be broadly vascular or non-vascular. And in vascular, the most important one is acute ischemic stroke. 
the acute ischemic stroke is uh, a sudden neurological event and the treatment is the time based so we cannot to waste our time to know the actual uh, covid status of the patient and we have to treat so we have to learn how to prevent our healthcare workers and uh, rest of the patients and our uh, machines infections and all the another important is embryomal sh this is uh, again uh, urgent patient another patients are bleeding anywhere in the body like epistaxis hemoptysis gi bleed hematuria and pph all these patients require urgent attention with the help of embolization acute limb ischemia and vascular injuries or pseudo aneurysm either post trauma post operative or roadside accidents the non vascular in these they abscess anywhere in the body with impending rupture the infective collections they cannot wait empyema pyoperitoneum pancreatic fluid, uh, fluid collections and cholangitis with uh, dilated biliary radicals so the patient selection as per uh, present guidelines all guidelines says avoid all elective or semi elective procedures to prevent nosocomial covid infection among healthcare workers and other patient because most of these patients cannot be meticulously uh, diagnosed or uh, covid status can be known uh, beforehand and uh, uh, the machines are common for the diagnostic most of the uh, in most of the institution or department the machines are relatively common for the diagnostic and as well as the therapeutic procedures and uh, many times these uh, procedures are long duration so whenever possible telephonic or online consultation and very important covid status does not alter inclusion or exclusion criteria for emergency life or organ saving ir procedures so basic principle one should keep uh, these principles are very much uh, prevalent on uh, net and uh, youtube channels and uh, all webinars i will uh, again stress them the detailed updated available knowledge about the disease process and natural history of covid 19 should be there among all the healthcare workers from class 4 to class 1 there is high chance of uh, transmission uh, due to respiratory secretions droplet and aerosols the viral viability this is a very important information that viral viability in a certain environment in the form of aerosol it can be for 3 hours so one should take care on the copper surface 4 hours cardboard 24 hours and the most dangerous one plastic and steel surface are most of the machines are combination of plastic and steel and metal so these surfaces can harbor the uh, this uh, virus for 2 to 3 days they should be isolated facilities in the terms of space machine and healthcare workers for the diagnosis planning and procedure for covid the communication all the communication should be either telephonic or with minimum 1 uh, meter distance with the patient or patient attendant or other whenever possible the patient procedure should be portable whenever it is possible so patient risk stratification whenever in the medical uh, terminology whenever we uh, talk about the patient risk it is the patient prognosis but in covid era the patient risk stratification means on the basis of risk of covid transmission to the healthcare workers and other patients so the low risk patients are where there is no fever respiratory symptoms are not there no definitive travel or contact history and the most important one documented covid negative and the high risk patients so other than these uh, these low risk patient all the patients are high risk where the fever cough and respiratory symptoms are there neurological symptoms sudden neurological symptoms gi symptoms recent travel or contact history and documented covid positive because of some other reasons so what are the objectives ir objectives during this uh, pandemic so early detection and limiting transmission to healthcare workers other staff and patient should be kept in mind maintenance of emergency ir services with adequate bare minimum staff hardware and precautions 
repeated i am again saying repeated training and education of healthcare workers by the infection control expert because daily the updates are changed they ensure uh, we must ensure the adequate availability supply of standard protective gear depending upon the risk stratification of the patient there should be ongoing review and formation of need based protocols and we must ensure the physical and mental health of healthcare workers and other supporting staff so in ir suite what should be the standard of care preferably ir suite should be approachable by the shortest possible route so if it is not available right now we can change our plans we can open new doors where the patient can be shifted to the uh, ir suite from shortest possible route and if it is available isolated or designated ir suite must be used but if it is not available the significant spacing and meticulous lab decontamination for the intervening procedures should be done for labs negative pressure ventilation or hepa filters are highly recommended but most of the time it is not available so keep the door closed during entire procedure and ac units can also be kept switched off shift out all the non essential equipments from your lab and bare minimum staff should be there inside dedicated donning and doffing areas should be there sterile draping of entire machine and other equipment with use of additional sheets must be there so this is uh, the example or planning of uh, the ir suite where those suites are there and we can see one of them is kept closed one is uh, open and there are different routes covid and non covid route they should not be mixed so even then if they are not available right now with us in our healthcare system we should learn this right now and we should practice this in future because covid is not going to go in a day month or year so it is going to stay with us so this is the example the entire machine is meticulously covered with uh, the drape sheets so that there should not be any contamination of any suspected or undiagnosed patient because uh, the machines are common and uh, covid suspect and uh, other patients are going to use the same machine so planning and protocols we can uh, have three stages of planning like pre operative when the patient uh, is not with us and uh, we are in discussion with uh, taking some patient the intra operative planning when the patient is with us inside the lab and post operative when the patient is being shifted out so one by one we should take care like minimum patient time in the suite with the help of meticulous planning detailed history and required procedure and required hardware should be arranged beforehand ensure the availability of protective gears beforehand and maximum use of disposable items and consumables should be practiced the entire operating team must be ready with the protective gears before the arrival of patient the consent again it is important it should not be from the close contact of the patient and uh, when it is not available a telephonic email or whatsapp consent with proper recording can be used to avoid the contact the general precautions for healthcare workers aware and training must for uh, work in high risk uh, patients use of limited gadgets this is very much important the wrist watch extra mobile laptop books wallet and pen should not be kept with you when you are going to lab or uh, in the other areas avoid ornaments like rings chains lockets etc and keep in good health proper diet and rest and hydration is must so this is the risk stratification and uh, level of protection uh, for the healthcare workers level 1 when the patient is on the opd basis and uh, the healthcare worker is uh, planning the patient in opd basis there the white coats disposable caps disposable isolation gowns 
and surgical mask can do. Level protection too when the patient reaches just outside the lab in the preparation room. Here we should uh, have N95 mask, safety goggles and the high level of protection in the high risk of patient inside the lab, full uh, face respirators, positive pressure respirators, protective suites and uh, disposable gloves, disposable shoe covers must be used. So intraop planning, proper covering of patient body and patient mask should be non-expiratory type is mandatory. Use of standard, uh, standard protective gear, N95 mask, PPE, gloves, anti-fog goggles and face shields must be used. Minimum staff all consum uh, consumable should be all uh, ready to uh, ready inside the lab. Pre-op screening with the fluoro or chest X-ray can be taken inside the cath lab. The patient preparation, I mean the IV line, urethral catheterization, intubation, they should be done all inside the lab only. We should not prepare this all these things outside the lab. And single set of healthcare worker should be there for single case regardless of the expected duration of the uh, procedure. The airway consideration for the low risk patients, the intubation can be avoided whenever possible with proper use of patient face mask. But with the high risk patients, low threshold uh, for intubation, especially the labs without uh, negative pressure ventilation or HEPA filters must be used. Intubation, extubation, and suction. These increase the risk of aerosolization and uh, which can stay in the environment for three hours. So anesthetist should be in the complete standard uh, protective gears with uh, minimum healthcare workers in the suite that time. After intubation, there is less risk due to closed circuit of patient ventilation and one should avoid the trial of extubation because it will add to the time in the high risk unstable patients. So in post-op uh, time, shift out the patient with minimum staff and shortest route. All the disposable item to be collected in designated and COVID marked double layer medical waste bag. Non-disposable items must put immediately in the antiseptic solution before further standard sterilization and immediate closure of the suite with preferable delayed at least 30 minute cleaning decontamination and sterilization of suite so apart from uh, our local uh, guidelines and uh, experience uh, these are the uh, guidelines used for uh, the preparation of this uh, document and uh, thank you all stay safe Keep aware and healthy and positive. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Ajay, for this wonderful insight into the uh, nitty gritties while performing intervention radiology during COVID-19. And while this is your last chance to post us your questions through the live chat, and uh, I'll be back with a panel of experts for the panel discussion in a very short while.
So welcome back and uh, many thanks to our panel of esteemed experts, uh, Professor Mandeep Khan, Professor Ajay Kumar and Dr. Anindita Sena. Well, uh, taking your questions and the panel discussion, I uh, will be starting up with uh, Professor Mandeep. Uh, Ma'am, you had talked in detail about uh, CT and uh, also you had talked that the sensitivity of CT is quite high, let's say around more than 90%, even it is more than RT-PCR, at the very same time there are some issues with the specificity. So there are some thoughts saying that uh, CT can be used for every patient, although you had talked about it, but I just want you to explain it in detail so that this ambiguity is pu put to rest and people do understand when the CT is ideally to be done. So, uh, CT has in the literature available so far, it has shown a very high sensitivity for the presence of findings which could be consistent with COVID-19. However, there is extreme considerable overlap with other uh, infections and uh, inflammatory processes such as all other viral pneumonias, uh, pneumocystis pneumonia in its early uh, stages, uh, drug to, uh, acute lung injury due to drug to toxicity due to any cause all of these findings can be similar and therefore its specificity of CT is very low so uh, if a patient is already presenting with a, a acute uh, influenza like illness or acute uh, uh, lung condition and uh, we we do not know that is this a patient with COVID-19 or not as far as possible, the testing, should be, if we can, we should wait for the test results to become available so that if the patient is a positive and say you have a machine which has been dedicated to the positive patients and the rest of the patients are being done on different machines, then the uh, patient is directed to the machine where you're doing, which is dedicated to COVID-19. If the clinical situation is such that we cannot wait for the test results and imaging is required, we should treat that patient as a suspect and do the imaging using all available precautions and making sure that the machine is disinfected immediately after imaging each patient and an adequate time gap is given before the next patient is taken. Can it be used as a screening tool? Uh, I don't think you can scan the entire population uh, with CT uh, to use it as a screening tool and we have to uh, depend upon other screening modalities and uh, uh, I, I think the uh, worldwide the best is the RT-PCR with moving on to more rapid tests now. Routinely if a patient is being imaged for a condition other than uh, COVID-19 say the patient has presented with a stroke, should we be doing, uh, and we are doing a CT angiography in that patient, should we do a rapid low dose screening CT of the chest? What are your thoughts on this, Dr. Ajay? Sorry, I didn't get that. I was reading those questions. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I Sorry. said if a patient is uh, being imaged for a condition other than COVID-19, for example, a patient has presented with an acute stroke. Yeah. Uh, I understand that we must do a clinical triage and if there are any symptoms uh, or signs which could be due to COVID-19, we should treat that patient as a suspect, right? But if you have no clinical signs or symptoms which could be uh, tilting towards COVID-19, in such a situation when doing the CT angiography of the patient, would you like to do a low dose screening of the chest as well? Uh, yes ma'am, this is a very important question and issue as well because uh, stroke patients, stroke patients or any neurological event, they present uh, suddenly and uh, we cannot uh, like uh, take out the complete history because the patient is sudden uh, deteriorated and we cannot make out whether the patient is deteriorated because of uh, his uh, respiratory or chest conditions or neurological. So there is mix of symptoms. So one cannot uh, take the detailed history from these patients out whether these patients are 
whatever their general condition is it is because of the neurological this thing or otherwise or chest conditions so whenever this uh, neurological event is there the patient is not available to talk to us in detail and uh, same time uh, we cannot waste our time in finding uh, these uh, minute details because that is going to kill our time for treatment of stroke if it is there if there is any large vessel occlusion so uh, anyways these patients whenever there, there is some neurological event anyways these patients are directed immediately toward a ct suite where nct head is done to rule out any hemorrhage or ischemic event and same time if it is uh, ischemic uh, hemorrhage is not there the ct angio is done and uh, now there is a question of whether we should go for uh, a ct chest or this thing there is a global uh, like uh, discussion about this what i personally feel if we can do a low dose uh, ct chest or screening and if we can see the scano uh, scanogram of the chest and uh, we can take decision on a scanogram whether we should perform a ct or not so if we are performing a ct that is going to help us if there are findings which may be typical or suspecting of covid because covid is also uh, this also uh, because of ards this also present acutely so if there are findings we are going to do procedure we can increase our risk stratification level to high from the intermediate to low inside the lab and same time we can shift the patient to a designated uh, area after the treatment of a stroke and whatever so in selected patients yes definitely to avoid the nosocomial uh, infection to rest of the patients if the patient is shifted uh, uh, with the other patients so it can be used but uh, meticulous uh, decision has to be taken well uh, thank you uh, professor ajay for uh, taking this and uh, professor mandeep as well uh, taking the talk ahead uh, there had been a discussion about the virus the vi viability of the virus party yes yes yes, yes. especially on the surfaces and uh, as you know all of us know that uh, most of the imaging machines are quite bulky the ct machine the mri machine so how what is the pgi protocol of disinfecting these machines after uh, each patient or how is it yes yeah, so i'll take that question and uh, basically it starts from training your hospital attendants and your sanitary attendants to be first of all aware that these have to be cleaned meticulously and we have done a, an extensive training program right from the time that the first day of lockdown started that is on 22nd march and madam and myself and even dr ajay sir has been taken and we have done a complete uh, thorough training with a disinfection process with help from our uh, hospital infection control committee team so the disinfection process does not start with the machine itself it starts from entering the room if you and you enter the room and your hand hygiene is not there properly so you will disinfect the uh, door so first of all we started with how to open the door with the elbow technique then before you start disinfecting you have to know that you have to wear the proper gear you cannot have people cleaning the machine or the room without proper gear and even your the sanitary attendant or the hospital attendant who are involved in machine cleaning or the room cleaning have to have an n95 a visor a cap gown mask gloves so our training started from training them how to wear these and how to import more importantly to take them out so each person was individually trained to do this first and after they went were trained then we had a disinfection process training of how to and what to clean the machines with so these machines are built with some structures mostly uh, plastic based structures which are sometimes damaged with the common disinfectant uh, Uh, that is used for the virus that is your uh, your chloride based your uh, hypochlorite solutions one percent hypochlorite solution is most commonly used here and also the alternatives which were available are the benzalkonium based uh, solution which is commonly known as lysol in the market so here we use one percent hypochlorite solution to clean the machine surfaces except for the touch surfaces where we cannot use the hypochlorite solution because it will damage the keyboards the mouse pads so for that 
we use the alcohol wipes and it has to be a minimum of 70% alcohol wipe and the precaution to be taken for cleaning the machine parts which are uh, can be cleaned is that the uh, hypochlorite solution is being made it has to be freshly made at, in the beginning of the day and there is a three step disinfection process which is used uh, we have a disinfection trolley which is a which has three bowls in it for machine cleaning one of it has warm water one has a uh, one person freshly made hypochlorite solution which has been made at the beginning of the day and the other has either another one person hypochlorite solution or a detergent based solution depending on how, upon how dirty the machine, machine is and we use three mops which are alternately uh, dipped into the hypochlorite solution and kept for a minimum of uh, one minute and the hospital attendant is uh, has been taught by our infection control team and infection control nurse how to wipe it clean with a one swipe technique so once uh, that is done, and it's a meticulous and time taking procedure but you have to motivate your workers to do it because otherwise you are placing not only the next patient at risk but also yourself at risk because as long as these surfaces where viruses can stick for days together to sometimes you know hours to days especially the stainless steel surfaces if you are not cleaning them any sort of uh, cross contamination is chancing, increasing the chances of infection to the next patient the next huge number of patients that radiology faces we are routinely investigating in our emergency setting around 100 to 150 CT scans per day which is a huge number and an excessive number of uh, x-rays so among them you don't know who is covid positive who is covid suspect who is covid negative because of the rush it's impossible to trace them at that area in the PGI uh, emergency setting at least so here every time everybody has to be on guard and on, on alert to clean these surfaces not only in the CT machine the x-ray machine but also the ultrasound machine and the ultrasound probe is another specific area where you cannot use either hypochlorite solution or um, uh, your uh, uh, alcohol wipes for a prolonged period because it damages the surface. So here also we have had to improvise. Most of the times we are using our, uh, these are known as low level disinfectants and uh, ideally uh, there are uh, commercially available UV filter, UV uh, cleaners available for the uh, probes but uh, that is also time consuming and we don't have it. So detergent based solutions are used to clean the probe best possible solution to clean the probe is to cover is to keep it uh, inside a, a disposable uh, probe cover but again many settings don't have it and don't have it in as large volume numbers so obviously training and implementing the disinfection protocol in all the machine settings in x-ray ct and uh, in the ultrasound is important as regards to mri mri is impossible to clean we uh, at the beginning of uh, the training program all of us sat down and we were at our wits end at about how to clean the MRI machine properly if a positive or even a suspect patient was done. And you know the MRI bore is huge. It is You can't take any metal inside to clean it. You probably can't clean it properly with a huge uh, sort of stick, wooden stick also. We had planned and tried to implement it with all sorts of improvisation. But we could not guarantee that the machine gantry which is a huge end with a lot of uh, and, and to be cleaned properly and with 100% guarantee that the next patient will not be infected or even the co-workers who are over there will not be infected. On top of it, MRI room is a closed system with no negative ventilation and no ventilation at all. And there is no possibility of ventilation over there. So it is best to avoid and this is the guideline from the international committees also that MRI is best avoided. And actually in, there, is a, there are very very few and I, even I can't name the life threatening situations where, it, where there is no alternative to MRI even for a stroke, CT and CT angio suffices. So there are very few needs of doing MRI in a COVID positive or a COVID suspect patient and it's best avoided because it can't be cleaned with any sort of guarantee. Uh, well, thank you for taking this. And uh, as we all know, the summer is almost at its peak and uh, most of the radiological machines are uh, known for the heat which they generate. So what are the practices and guidelines for air conditioners? Uh... So this is a very... Uh... Uh, tricky uh, question and uh, the situation will vary depending upon what kind of practice you have in your clinic or in your hospital. Uh, we are lucky here that we had one CT in a stand alone building which does not have any other radiological equipment inside that building. So after consultation with our um, uh, AC engineers and with the help of the hospital infection control uh, team, what we arrived at is that uh, the ACs in that area are kept on and the cooling is kept on so that the machine uh, is, does not, uh, is not affected. 
and just before uh, the patient is shifted from our COVID hospital to our building, we shut off the ACs just a minute or two before the patient is received and the ACs remain off for the duration of the scan and once the patient is shifted out for the duration of the disinfection and once the disinfection process has uh, taken place and the doffing of the uh, healthcare workers has been done, at that point we leave the windows and doors of the entire building open for adequate air exchange with nobody inside the building and after one hour our, uh, the, there is a uh, access available to us for accessing the AC uh, machines inside the building and we just use that door to switch on the ACs and shut the uh, building for the next six hours. Now this is possible only because we have a CT in a standalone building. If you have uh, as part of your main hospital or as your clinic, uh, it would be very difficult. Uh, you need to, of course to keep the patient masked at all times and the uh, healthcare workers in PPE. But uh, the same uh, uh, goes that the AC will need to be off for the duration that the patient is inside. Well, uh, thank you for the Dr. Taking the job. So, what I stated, like uh, right now we are having labs, whatever we were having in past, but right now we are in learning phase, and we can reiterate all these for our future uh, planning. So, this is a so, very important take-home message. So, that the standard of care is the negative ventilation system with HEPA filters. So, right now our lab is not uh, having this. And we have planned our uh, the next uh, uh, angiographic lab, and uh, there we have asked. So there is a hell lot of difference of the price of uh, the simple ACs and ACs uh, with negative pressure and HEPA filter. But in long term, the healthcare burden is going to be decreased, and this will be very much cost effective. So basically, so, our interventional radiology suites, particularly. Yeah need to be designed as OTs with all uh, precautions uh, for prevention of uh, infections. And uh, where your, your diagnostic machines are there, I think uh, uh, they, you can, there are uh, instances where the AC system can support, your existing AC system can support the retrofitting of HEPA filters or the placement of HEPA filters inside the suites. So I think all radiologists uh, should be looking at these alternatives uh, for uh, as the future because uh, as Dr. Ajay said, uh, COVID-19 is not going to go away. It's here and it's here to stay and all our planning for the future has to be done with this in mind. Uh, well, uh, so the take home message is that uh, as and when uh, more researchers are pulling in, more data is pulling in. So more innovation is coming on to this aspect aspect of uh, proper disinfection uh, as far as the surfaces are concerned, the machinery is concerned and also the air and the other atmosphere is concerned. Well, taking the talk a little ahead, uh, there is a very interesting question from one of our viewers and uh, as we know that RT-PCR generally takes like 7 to 8 hours for the report to be available. Uh, whereas the chest x-ray it's like almost like instant so uh, some of the viewers are they are of their opinion uh, or rather they want to ask how good is it a strategy of uh, going ahead with the chest x-ray of every patient and uh, using them uh, to prioritize as far as the reporting is concerned or won't it make much of a difference if report is available let's say seven hour after uh, uh, if you, the, the, firstly, uh, are we thinking of uh, using radiographs or CT? CT, I would definitely say no. Radiographs also, uh, all cases, see, you you are triaging patients. If there is uh, a fever present or something, you, okay, you can say that he is a COVID suspect and he is prioritized for testing. But suppose the patient is asymptomatic and we have seen uh, in our city a large number of patients who were found to be positive on contact tracing were asymptomatic 
and this is going to be the scenario in the future also that you have completely asymptomatic uh, people who may have come to the hospital for anything else how can we say that we are going to do a chest x-ray in every patient it's not going to be practical it's, if our daily footfall in the opd is in thousands you cannot perform thousands of x-rays before the patient enters the hospital so I don't think you can use that as a strategy to uh, prioritize who undergoes testing. It's not very practical in that sense. And the second most important thing, a normal x-ray will give you false sense of security. Yeah. And uh, that may backfire. So this is a very important so, point that a yeah. false sense of security. A false sense of security may backfire. So not because not only can x-rays be uh, normal, even CTs have been found in literature to be normal. So... Uh, so we cannot really use them as a screening, screening tool or a diagnostic tool, but they can be an adjunct uh, yeah. as clinical. Yeah. As yeah. per the current literature evidence that is coming up uh, in the last few days, what has come up is that uh, the findings may be even missed in or missed or maybe normal in as high as 60% of the cases. So if you do CT or X-ray to try these patients, you are actually doing an injustice. Uh, it's not that it's not that easy. If you group in a patients who have symptoms already and you know that the patient is probably going to turn out to be a you have a high clinical suspicion, then you then obviously you've already tried or based on clinical suspicion and you do chest X ray to rule out uh, whether it's a, there are complications or a patient is uh, what kind of lung involvement is there. But to try it on the basis of chest X ray would be taking the a step backwards, not a step forwards. Well, uh, thank you for taking this. Uh, while myself and I believe all our viewers are enjoying this uh, this practical panel discussion which is going on over here, uh, due to time constraint, I am forced to take the last question of the day and it is about PPEs, personal protective equipment. And there had been a huge, uh, you know, hue and cry about it. Uh, as you know that most of our viewers are from uh, very peripheral areas, some district hospitals, PHCs, CHCs and others. So, uh, can you suggest the guidelines for PPEs specifically for the for the technicians, the radiology technicians? There are two types. I mean, some who are coming in contact with the patient, and some who are not actually coming in contact with the patient. Uh, they are sitting on the console, let's say. So, no, I don't so think the... there would be any radiology technician who is not coming in contact with the patient because even when you position the patient for the CT scan, the technician has to position after uh, coming into the same room. And uh, definitely for radiographs as well, uh, they, so the technicians are definitely coming in contact with the patient and more importantly are the ultrasound operators because the positioning of the patient for CT or X-ray can still be done from certain distance. But an uh, ultrasound operator has to be, I mean, he has to be within arm's length of the patient. So a couple of uh, things is uh, some practical points which we have been uh, using and advising our residents is simple things that uh, do, uh, the patients should all be masked the patient's face should be turned away from the operator and if possible try and perform the ultrasound using the patient in the left lateral decubitus position so that he is facing away and the distance is being maximized between the operator and the patient as regards pp dr anandata would you like to clarify yeah what people in the periphery can use yeah, so right now, uh, even in the periphery, uh, as per my communication with at least my friends who are working in the periphery in many of the health centers, PPE availability is, till now, God forbid, is not an issue. N95 is absolutely a must. Even uh, yesterday, we have had an unfortunate incident of a sanitary worker passing away in Ames who was not a primary worker, was actually a supervisor. So you don't know about the dangers of this disease and it is striking us every day coming closer and closer. It is better to be safe than sorry. You don't need to have a false sense of bravado. N95 with a visor. See, these are basic precautions where you are, you should not, you should not, you, you will be touching, your hand will be dirty. You will be uh, trying to touch your mouth, your nose. It's an automatic reflex that we have. And there are, you generally touch it two to three thousand times a day without realizing. So an N95 mask, a goggles and a visor will help you not touch your mouth, ear and nose for a direct spread from yourself, from, from a contaminated hand to you. This is one. Second is droplets will be prevented by your, by your visor. 
and your N95 is a filter which will act against even aerosol based procedures. So this is a must and so that the uh, your work, your home clothes are not uh, contaminated, wear a gown, a, preferably a fluid resistant gown. If you have a linen gown, wear a plastic apron over it. Definitely have gloves, sanitize with sanitizer multiple times on your gloves, discard it as frequently as you can. Shoe cover, again shoe cover, uh, we have practiced taping the shoe cover so that there is no latent space between the shoe cover and your shoe and caps. These are the basic minimum precautions which now should actually be our dress code whenever we go out to work as radiologists because we can't do a sort of tele uh, radiology investigation for reporting it's okay but when you are doing an x-ray the technician is going and placing the patient chest x-ray and uh, in one foot away from the patient not even one foot away from the patient he's basically touching the patient who's maybe coughing sneezing and uh, is actually at potential risk of uh, catching the infection himself or herself if he's not taking these basic precautions and wearing it uh, the, properly and also knows how to doff it properly and as madam said even in the uh, ultrasound we are doing an ultrasound for 10 to 15 minutes a, a simple ultrasound takes 10 to 15 minutes uh, gynecological ultrasound takes even more 20 to 30 minutes and if the patient is not masked and if you're not properly dressed yourself you will be at increased risk of catching the infection yourself so prepare yourself mentally as well as physically hydrate yourself before going into duty because if you have been given a full pp at the even at the peripheral level and many people are getting the full pp hydrate properly because in that four to six hour duty you will not be able to doff it and again wear it that is not uh, an option once you wear it you are wearing it for four to six hours in this heat and if the ac is off we have had people collapsing in our institutes in the last few days because of shifting in the sun so properly hydrate some are advocating adult diapers i don't know how practically it is feasible but proper hydration food is absolute must before you don your ppe and go to work not wearing proper ppe even level 3 ppe or level 2 ppe is again not an option so wear it to stay safe and know how to disinfect it also and know how to take it off the visor is a very low cost uh, method of protecting yourself it is available for 50 to 100 rupees even amazon has it and you can just buy it and uh, just disinfect it for 20 minutes buy two for yourself disinfect it by placing it in one percent hypochloric solution for 20 minutes while you wear the other one and wait for it to clean for uh, the uh, next half an hour and this is as easy as it, as it is but we have to discipline ourselves to wear it and know how to take it off slowly doffing is a very very slow process we should not be in a hurry to doff or take out the pp that we are wearing because that is where aerosols are generated and that is how people get infected most so this is the message and it should go to all people who are radiologists and technicians and all our health associate healthcare workers like hospital attendants and sanitary attendants who are helping us uh, well, uh, many thanks to our panel of experts and with this we have come to an end of today's webinar session on radiology in COVID-19. I personally want to thank Professor Mandeep, uh, Professor Ajay and Dr. Anindita for taking out time for this webinar. And many thanks to the audience uh, who had joined us from various parts of the country and also for posing their questions to us. And I would also like to flash on your screens the PGI coronavirus helpline number, which is 0172 I repeat, 0172 And you can very well make use of uh, this helpline for all your coronavirus related queries and clarifications. And with this, uh, I am signing out uh, until we meet again for the next webinar. Thank you, Jenny.